Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility. This is episode 49. It's Monday the 8th of October, and tonight we're chatting to Alex Harris, who himself says he was put on this earth to shift the way people respond to the word impossible. Good evening and welcome to Let's Talk Possibility. It's my turn, Eric Vermeulen, to host tonight's show again and in the studio with me, Jonathan Dix. Jonathan, how are you doing? Eric, very good. Thanks to you. Uh, Brilliant. Mm. We've got another exciting guest, I think, lined up. And I I seem to just get these uh, adventurers all the time. But uh, in studio with us tonight, Alex Harris. Alex, how are you? you? I'm good. Thank you, Eric. A bit of background. You've climbed the odd mountain and uh, (laughs) I I, I, I make light of that. (laughs) I, I've lived a reasonably adventurous life. Eh? Yeah, reasonably compared to the other guy. seven billion people on this planet, I doubt that. Yeah. So, <laughs> a, a bit of background, I mean, Alex. You've climbed the seven summits, the highest mount peak on every continent on the planet. Yeah. Uh, you've walked unassisted to the South Pole. Yes, which was very cold. Uh, you, Something I won't do again. So, two vif, you know, sort of cold temperature things, and now you're planning something a bit the opposite. Yeah, we're planning, well, we've been involved in trying to figure the empty quarter expedition, which is to cross the Arabian Desert unsupported. And it's one of the last, there's a handful of things that people have said for a long time that it's impossible to do, and and that's one of them. So that's what we're busy gnawing at that puzzle at the moment. Mm -hmm. So as as soon as you hear the word, it's impossible to do, that is the chemical trigger. Yeah, indeed. It's like a good whiskey. Something gets going. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I get fired up and, uh, you know, a a seed is sown and and when the timing is right and it's been watered down the line, I sit down and I think about just why those people said that and what the implication is and start unraveling that that problem and and redefining it. And that's part of the challenge, I guess. What, the the planning part or...? Everything. Making what someone thinks is impossible into a venture that becomes possible. And I don't mean just the actual physical going out and doing it, but the process of unraveling, understanding the dynamics of what's involved, finding the sponsors, it's like training. A, it's like a mental readiness as well. Yeah, it's like an, a, it's a mini space project. <laughs> you know, for want of uh, no easy way to get into space. I think space sounds like it's going to be easier to go to <laughs> <laughs> well, than crossing yeah. a desert unassisted or some, I don't know, harsh, harsh environment. Yeah, look, space is expensive. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and I always wanted to be an astronaut as a youngster. In fact, I wanted to be a Jedi Knight when I was <laughs> very young. And I, I didn't get that right. But I, I still have desires to get into space. So I'm, I'm, I guess, in the process of solving worldly problems before I figure out how to get up there, climb okay. Olympus on that, Mars. Yeah. But, I mean, Alex, how do you find your next seemingly impossible adventure? Well, I don't particularly go out with that goal in mind. Let's find something that's likely to get me killed or close to it that most people will think is harebrained. That's not the starting point. they linked to things I'm passionate about. And this is part of this intricate idea of purpose. And, I mean, I'm a, a strong proponent of this idea that nothing's impossible, but... There's a context to that, and that context is around themes like season in your life, like your purpose, like your skill set, your gifting. The ruthless and diligent application of energy and intention, when those things work together, that particular melting pot, nothing's impossible. Mm. And so, as an example, we came back from Everest in 2005. I'd completed the seven summits. That journey was 15 years in the making. I've got many other mountain objectives, but I knew at least that project had at last, in in a sense, come to an end. And so in the wake of that, you think, what next? People had said, I'd spent 70 days on Everest with Rand Fiennes. He'd obviously spoken about his polar expeditions. Mm -hmm. He'd said, look, it might be possible for you guys to walk to the South Pole, you and Cebu. No Africans ever done that unsupported. And... We thought it was a good idea because Antarctica is an intriguing place. I'm also wired to explore the human psyche and the the physiological dynamic in these extreme places. So I also want to know what's the limit. And when you put those things together, it made sense at that time 
to try and figure out how could we go to the South Pole. And then again, with success after that, we began thinking about what was next. I knew guys had been to the North Pole. Yeah, I was kind of keen, but uh, it didn't excite me that much. I have grown a, a big, a profound distaste for the cold when you've been in, in Antarctica <laughs> for s as long as I have and other places. So we were looking for something different. And Ran had said something interesting on Everest. Now, this is a guy that the Guinness Book of Records calls the greatest living explorer. His CV reads like a National Geographic atlas. And <laughs> I asked him, what did he think was out there that hadn't been done? And incidentally, he'd spent a fair bit of his time with the British forces in Oman. And he said to me, look, the empty court to the Arabian desert, the Rub al Khali, as the Arabs call it, has never been crossed unsupported. And he said, I'll be your patron. And then he said the trigger. <laughs> he said, but I won't come with you because you'll die. I think it's impossible. <laughs> and so a seed was sown. And that was still in 2005. We still had to go to the South Pole and solve that problem. But when that seed is sown, it will, like any seed with water and the right lifestyle and the mm. right habits, flower and bloom into the idea and the amount of energy that's required to take the next step. And so that was kind of uh, the genesis, I guess, of the empty quarter expedition. You mentioned a few interesting things there. You said the, the, the importance of having, when you're watering it, the, the mm. right lifestyle, the sort of right elements. Does a lot of that come with the, when you start to deconstruct the, the impossible notion and see what is, what is necessary? Or is that sort of something that's in innately inside of you? I think it's, you cultivate habits by making the right choices consistently at the right time. They don't necessarily get the desired result. For example, the summit of Everest. I had yeah. to go three times, three expeditions over nine years. But at critical junctures in those expeditions, we were faced with decisions and we made the right decision. And so the result was not what we wanted, but we got them alive. We had mm. learned more about risk and assessment. And so okay. when you make consistently good decisions, yeah. ideas like risk assessment become a lifestyle. It also gets you into places that most people don't. And so I'd learned how to deal with the death zone after three Everest, two Everest expeditions before the final one. I knew a lot about altitude and the body's physiology. So I, I was, in an empirical sense, far better qualified to go back a third time and yeah. so statistically, statistically have a better shot. So what I'm saying is, in my DNA, there's no question God has seeded certain potential. Sure. And over my life, making consistent certain decisions has allowed that potential to, to bloom, let's say, mm. use that analogy. And then it's a question of constantly pushing the boundary. And I, and I don't mean here a physical out there boundary. I mean an internal and mental boundary. And this is maybe linked to the idea of how do you define possible. And so it's not settling. So I, as a rule, as a rule, when someone says something's impossible, no matter how ir ridiculous the idea is, yeah. I just let it bounce off me. So I have a, a, a almost a, a titanium facade that just bounces that ridiculous notion. And and it might be in a in a sort of a nonsensical, jovial way that stuff really is ridiculous, you know, like a twenty meter long jump for example, now. But so that's my first response. My second response then is a is a deeper one and that's to think why that person is saying that. And typically we make assumptions on things based simply on our knowledge of an mm. area and domain. And there's only a limited amount of things we can be experts on. And so statistically that means most people who say something's impossible are going to be wrong because they're going to be talking about something that is out of their domain. So I qualify who that person is mm -hmm. and then history tells you a lot. You know, for example, the desert expedition there are a handful of guys that have crossed it on camels, Thesiger, Thomas, Philby. We're talking about guys sort of in the 30s, 40s. And they recorded a lot about the way of life of the Bedou and moving with camels, the temperatures. Not much of what they recorded is relevant today. But specifically to this challenge, 
10 years ago, whenever Google Earth was invented, mm. radically changed that conversation. Yeah. Because in Thesis' yeah. time, he had no way of seeing an aerial high-level view from space almost of the terrain and the dunes and would not be able to conclude that maybe on foot there's a way to solve the puzzles by linking. You see, the way the empty quarter is, is made up, it, it's quite fascinating ge geographically. You've had over time, wind has moved the dunes into these reasonably permanent formations. They move every year, but for, for our practical reason, they're the same. Mm -hmm. So you get these monster high dunes, soft sand, obviously difficult to carry a cart over weighing 300 kilos. But in between these dunes are these flat pans, and these pans are relatively hard. You can move quite easily with a heavy cart along the surface. And the pans are one, two, three kilometers a, a, across. They vary. Mm. And so when you're standing in a pan, all you see is the next dune in front of you, as yeah. Thesiger would have seen. He had no idea that if he had gone left at this point, the pans he would have link. linked to another pan that would have linked to a long roof that might go 50 kilometers and miss out two days of dunes. Yeah. Google Earth tells me that in five minutes. So, in a way, technology in this puzzle has maybe changed the conversation where a guy like Thesiger would have said impossible. And Rand certainly is of that mold. With all his records, he is one of the golden age explorers almost. He's old not school. A, he's old school. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, he's, you know, I, I know how technologically generations, uh, their, their, their ability to adapt increases with time. My three-year-old's already playing with my iPad in a way I only learned last week. You know? <laughs> so, you know, Rand, and I can see why Rand said it's impossible, because he's thinking through Thesiger's eyes. And I look at it in Google, and suddenly I see a very large puzzle, and there is a way to solve it. It's intricate, it's visual, it requires boldness, but meticulous planning, mm -hmm. but there's a way to solve it. And so, yeah, I mean, to answer the question about these, uh, you know, the ground being fertile, it's a combination of your DNA, that context, that melting pot of gifting, season, purpose, application, and then just having a absolute stubbornness to believe anything that someone says when it's negative about their ability to do something until mm -hmm. you've invested the energy yeah. and proven to yourself it is or it isn't. But, and, and, I mean, I, th I think also you, you've spent probably more than 365 days in below freezing through, you know, in, through your sort of adventure career. You've still got all your fingers, all your toes, yeah. so you say. Um, <laughs> And, and I think having followed some of your other expeditions, uh, the Freedom Challenge, where I spent some time with you, I think what's, what sets you apart is that absolute attention to detail. Mm. Uh, and a, as you just said, you, well, well, once you sort of hone in on something, you go and find out as much as you can about it. Um, yeah. And it, it astounds me how, as we were speaking before we came on air, that someone contacted you a month ago who wants mm. to go and do the desert crossing that you're planning in yeah. January and you've been planning it for three or four years yeah. they've been at it for a month yeah um, uh, how do you where does that inquisitive nature come from look that I can say unequivocally is something that you know God's put in me I mean that's just how I've been wired we wired differently I Although, let me put that into context. I'm convinced we all start this journey inquisitive. I see it in my babies. I see it in all babies. We all start out, because that's the primary way people learn, by making mistakes. And you only make a mistake when you try and do something that you don't know the result or you're hoping for a different result. But there's a result and you learn. You've made a mistake. And so the root of that is in inquisitive, having an, an inquisitive mind. And you see that in babies all the time, in youngsters. And at some point, society conforms them. And we lose, we lose our, our desire to inquire about things and ask questions. When someone stands up in a conference room and asks who can sing, you don't put up your hand. Unless you've, you're a speaker like we are, and you know yeah. it's a trick question, because we can all <laughs> sing. And then you might put up your hand. You know? So we lose. The world conforms us. And, and one of the, the downsides of conformity is your ability to, your innate ability to ask questions. Some careers 
are more prone to it. So my career, no doubt, getting out early in, in, as a youngster, exploring by nature, I'm looking at maps, asking questions. Mm -hmm. So there's no question in the formative years, I, I, I ingrained those already innate characteristics. But I'm convinced we all start out life like it. And it is still in all of us, this desire. It's just been squashed by, yeah. by life. Do you think that the technology revolution is, is helping or hindering that natural inquisitiveness that we have? I mean, who did we ask before Google? Uh, uh, it's like Wikipedia Britannica. Yeah. <laughs> where, where do you see our youngsters going with with, with being inquisitive and well, pushing I boundaries? Well, I think we all have Google, but we're not all looking at the same thing on Google or using it. So I might be using Google Earth. Someone might be using it to find out where's the, the, the nightclub around. And so technology is, I think, reinforcing good and bad habits already in us. So if you're inquisitively minded in the areas of exploration and geography, yeah. Google's been a revelation. For me, I, I'm on it every day on Google Maps and Google Earth, looking, exploring, uh, realizing that this has never been done. That can still be done. But if you have no interest in that and you only geared towards a certain way, whether it's entertainment or this or that, then Google is reinforcing those habits, good or bad. So I think technology is a tool that will allow youngsters to develop great habits but that process the challenge I think will be to facilitate that process mm. for mentors for parents to understand the risks and the opportunities with technology and to just try and inculcate some adventurous habits in their youngsters and to say here here's a tool that can really show you the world but you need the desire to yeah. to go out and see, you know. Because I mean, you, you mentioned the word adventure and adventurous, and everyone thinks of yourself as an adventurer. And if you look at the origin of the word adventure, mm -hmm. essentially, something that is adventurous is is any undertaking of which the outcome is uncertain. Mm -hmm. And against that, you almost wouldn't necessarily embark on an expedition if the outcome was that uncertain because you know for yourself that you probably have to come home from this yes but in the makeup of that expedition there's uncertainty written into every day for example in in the desert every june you crest opens a new vista and that is something that i genuinely get thrilled about when i get on my bike and i'm training for the freedom and i'm out west in the trails i will almost every ride maybe 80% of the time purposefully take a track here or there that I've never been on because mm. I, I just want to see where it goes I want to know what's on the other side it's in me it's something I've reinforced over the years and it's something I can't help so it's not that I'm only interested in solving something if the thing is guaranteed or whether the risk is great except if it's going to be totally life threatening no for me, the world is one big question mark. It's another reason why I love caving. It's the same story, manifesting in a different way. You go down a little squeeze, tight worm hole, you're scratching, you bang your head, you, you finally turn that corner, you don't know what your eyes are going to see. Mm. But you do know you're going to see them for the first time. And that thrills me. Seeing something even trivial for the first time really thrills me. No, I think also the word adventure is going to be different for different people. I mean, I think you're just on an, on an extreme level. Um, but, but for me, I know when I went scuba diving for the first time, just the ability to breathe underwater in the swimming pool on the shallow end was mind-blowing. Yeah. Never done that before. Here you are. The, I could stand up yeah. and breathe yeah. fine. And I just think that was, for me, a spectacular. And now when you do go diving, it's, yeah. it's wonderful. And that, that for me is the adventure. Yeah. I'm not... So, I mean, Not at your level, but I mean, I think it's, it's going to be different for different people. And that's exciting. And I think they have to have that inquisitive nature. Because they don't, then they are going to be stuck inside and they're not going to be doing... They're not going to be testing their potential. Well, I, I think then maybe, John, the real challenge for the average people is to find the adventure in everyday life. Yeah. In other words, to go and seek that something that they haven't seen yet. To go and find mm. something that, you know... Uh, I suppose the, the cliched question is when was the last time you did something for the first time? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and, and, and it could be taking 
going to eat at a different restaurant or okay. taking a different route to work or just doing something out of the pattern, out of the ordinary. Let me ask you a tough question. You could live your life being quite mediocre, doing your job as your employers expect of you mm. your entire life and get to the end of it and die reasonably content. Is that wrong? I don't think it's wrong. Because the question hints at this idea of the difference between excellence and mediocrity. Mm. And the one problem with ignorance is that you don't know there is the opportunity yeah. to excel. And n not knowing that means you're probably not motivated to go out and experience it. So yes, that mediocre person might get to the end of their life and die fairly content, but I think they reach a point where they had no idea how amazing the journey actually could have been. Yeah. And so it's not saying that the mediocre person is wrong. It's just saying there's something far more thrilling. Something As content as you are, there's something far more uplifting about this world, about this journey through this earth than just being content to be mediocre. And that's the risk. You know, I, I mean, I, I get resistance sometimes in the corporate work I do in trying to fire up people. And, yeah. and the argument that gets thrown is that, well, that guy's called to sweep those halls. He can't do, he doesn't have skill sets. I'm not convinced. I'm, I, I'm convinced people make impact according to their circle of mm. influence, mm -hmm. but their ability to make impact in that specific role or task is linked to their sense of life and, and adventure and willing to take risks and just explore irrespective of what, what it is they're doing. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a financial thing. You know, it can be, I mean, you, you love food. You, you can go out of your way to go to some small little town simply because you've heard there's this little place that bakes this cookie or that fat cook. Mm. You know, I mean, it's a simple analogy, but it's just not being content with mediocrity. You know, that's, that's what fires me and, well, think, and drives me. I think another good example is, and Eric's just made me aware of it, is that, you know, you've, you've recently, or I wouldn't say recently, you've, you've, you've now got another degree mm. in sports psychology. And I studied sports psychology, and I, I love that. So, yeah. But for me, it's the mental battle with yourself on the on the field but I what I've taken there's, I, there's a lot I think that anyone can take into their their own personal lives but for me what I take away from that is that actually then you're re-challenging yourself for something mm. completely different uh, irrespective of what age you are you don't sure. have to be young to study you can be mm. studying your entire life and I think you should actually study your entire life mm. it doesn't have to be a degree it can be just about anything well, you've reminded me of something that I've thought often about. And yeah, I mean, I, I loved studying. I loved the content of sports psychology and, and the associated subjects. But I'll tell you this, the if I had to take a handful of the most powerful mental epiphanies around that subject that I've ever had, they've been on expeditions. They haven't been in that classroom yeah. reading mm -hmm. the knowledge. It's been actually out there on the edge where I am staring into an abyss in my mind and it's dark and it's black and I wish I had a way I could kill myself but I couldn't because <laughs> there was nothing around and there was no deep hole or precipice just the flatness <laughs> and, and my nonsense and my partner's nonsense those, those are the times that I, I've learned more about just that phenomenon of, of mental issues so there's something powerful about going out and doing and learning and you know, when that's coupled, I mean, there's no question when it was coupled with the stuff I was learning in the class, it obviously made a, rele a relevance that was mm. very specific and very powerful. But even aside, I mean, you just, you go and just go and do something, get out there, get out of the city, go away on the weekend, get into the hills. You know, guys are like, nah, I'm not, I don't like mate, nature. And uh, you are a physical being. Mm. You are made to like nature. You're a physical entity, you know, so it's crazy. I mean, I, it's a problem with city life. We get into a rut and, and you get battered every day by the hardness of the city. It's hard to get to the office in our traffic and still be positive. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It takes, you've got you to have 
Del Carnegie to the power of 10 <laughs> on your... I mean, even you were saying you were looking to move the house closer to the office. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, we fight a battle every day to protect what we stand for. And if you don't stand for something, you stand for nothing. And, and then you are almost nothing because that's all we have is, is what we stand for. And when people isolate themselves in a room in an office nine to five, there's not a hell of a lot they can stand for. You know, yeah. they, they can't, you know, it's one of the reasons I'm, uh, I'm passionate about older politics, politicians. I really don't think youngsters should get into politics because they <laughs> haven't resolved their issues. <laughs> You've got to go and live and experience the world and deal with your personal stuff. And then when you've dealt with it, you can get into politics mm. and serve. You can't serve when you're still serving yourself. And young, yeah, young people serve themselves. It's, you know, that's... Uh, but, I mean, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. and there, there could be another side of saying, when you put yourself in harm's way on an expedition, mm. people could say, well, Alex, you're serving yourself. Mm. What about Nadia and the kids at home? Sure. I try and take them. But they don't like the cold. <laughs> they don't like the cold. They don't like the, the climbing of the sandy dunes. <laughs> no, it's a good question. And I tell you what keeps me going is the, the feedback after a talk or a session that someone pops me an email and the encouragement I get that I must continue down this road because it's very clear that this is, this is my skill set. This is my mm. gifting. This is what I'm wired to do. But in the context of family, it means my assessment of risk has changed, obviously, since getting a couple of uh, young little girls. So I think about the opportunities. I, I invest more energy in assessing the risk of the opportunity, not just the physical risk, but the financial risk. How, how connected is it to, to this timeline, this, yeah. this idea of purpose and season? And you make a, a decision. That's not perfect, but it's, it's qualified. And Nadia, my wife, and I, we, we share the same faith. So we speak in the same language when we talk about purpose and God's will for my life, certainly. And I'm very clear about getting up there and speaking about certain aspects around this theme of impossibility because I do know that I have a unique skill set. Not a lot of guys can race 10 days with two hours sleep a night and, and get to the end and still be positive. That's a risky thing to do. Yeah. And I'm not expecting people to do that, but I'm, I am expecting them to say, you know what? I'm made for more. And your journey is to answer the question, what is more? My, my journey is to, is to be the catalyst, to shift the way people think around those ideas, those themes, to go back home and think, you know what? I can do more with my life. Yeah, if you go and climb Kilimanjaro, great. But that's that's not what I'm about. I, I'm simply there as a defender. Interesting thing, my name is Alexander, and in Greek it means defender of men. And times have changed a lot. We don't defend men unless you're in the security forces, which is quite prevalent, I guess, for us. <laughs> but by and large, that's not the application. And, and I remember getting a... a, a, a word of encouragement from a friend a long time ago and it suddenly put into perspective this idea of purpose for me I think my my job on earth is to defend the dreams of men to stand almost as a an intercessor between the ideas that people have on their hearts mm. and the world that's trying to rob them that's that's why I'm on this planet I I shift ideas like impossibility because I stand and I'm a reminder that you have a dream and you've got to live it, whatever that dream is. And that's an important thing. I think when we live dreams, it's the best evidence that hope is still a great thing, that we can still do something with our lives. When you see someone ordinary, I grew up in Kensington. Have you looked at the hills and mountains around Kensington? Linksfield Ridge is 300 meters above Queen Street, I grew up on Queen Street. I went to Leicester Road Primary. I went to Queen's High School. I think I was the first guy from Queen's High to climb Everest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping I'm not the last. <laughs> but I, and I grew up in a family that had no desire in the outdoors. My folks didn't like the outdoors. So I, I grew up really as an ordinary individual. And here's the key. 
we all ordinary in a sense the extraordinary part of us is this belief and that's something people can gain and it's a, it's an important point because people think no i'm not gifted i don't have your endurance i can't stay up all night i don't have your skills this this that no you have the ability to believe in a profound and powerful way and that's extraordinary yeah. and that's the difference between people the extent to which we believe we can do something and and how we define these ideas of possible and impossible it's uh, truly amazing yeah. and uh, i mean it, we started this conversation talking about external stuff expeditions and climbing mountains and crossing deserts and i think we've ended this conversation talking about internal stuff focus mm. on what you can control well and finding out how you can control stuff that you think you can't control yeah um and to push yourself to go and do your homework and to find that purpose and, and just though. keep pushing towards it no one likes homework <laughs> <laughs> although it could be costly especially in the kind of expeditions you're embarking on you need to be obsessed about the details. Eric asked a question earlier about yeah. the details. Yeah. When you are on the cutting edge, you must become obsessed about the details. You need to live, eat, sleep. You need to become the expert. I, I get, I field emails now about guys wanting to go to the desert. I don't consider myself an expert, but in the context of what no one has done, we've done a lot in mm. our three years of training and preparing. So, yeah, I mean, obsessed about the details is critical because it, it's it's going to save your life it's going to save your life and it's going to save you a whole lot of money and it's yeah. going to give you a real shot at mm. succeeding at getting it right especially when you're creating a precedent when you're doing something that a lot of people have done you've got a, a legacy to look and read and research and see what went right what went wrong when you're doing something for the first time you creating the precedent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, let, let, let's take that internally some more. When you're living your life, no one else has lived your life. You are creating your own precedent. Yeah. And so, we, you know, you, you can't go anywhere to find out how someone's lived your life mm. because it hasn't been done. You're the first one to Giggles go. of no help and, there. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it goes back to Alex, what you were saying. Find your purpose. Find out everything you can about how you're going to do that. Uh, and then go out there and do it. I've got a question on Facebook. Um, what is your next challenge? I mean, we talked about this Arabian desert, desert. Arabian desert crossing. What is your timing for that timeline? We're going in about two and a half months. And wow. yeah, that's close. Eh? Oof. And <laughs> the idea is to walk across the Arabian desert. So starting in Salala in Oman and walk north through Saudi Arabia into the United Arab Emirates at getting to Abu Dhabi and hopefully doing that in about 40 days because that's the sum total of the water we can carry. <laughs> if we are there longer than 40 days, we're in trouble. So can we get you for the show just what, <laughs> two weeks after you Yes, back? I'll be very sunburned. <laughs> Absolutely. Folks, uh, if there aren't any other questions, I think we've just about run out of time for tonight's show. Yeah. Um, if you'd like to continue the conversation with Alex, why don't you get in touch with him at, on his email address, alex at alexharris.co.za, or get in touch with him on Twitter. His handle is at Alexander Harris. Um, if you'd like to keep the conversation going with us at Let's Talk Possibility, um, follow us on our Facebook page or on Twitter, our Twitter handle at LT Possibility. Um, so don't just think about it. Go out and do it. Follow us on ltp.letstalknetwork.tv. Good night.